the great news of the gospel. As I said, this is Romans 7, and it's controversial. I mean, a lot of people argue this is Paul before he was saved, and then other people argue this is Paul after he was saved. Now, you may remember from last time that we presented a lot of evidence leading up to this point where it's pretty clear that at least uh, from that vantage point that Paul is talking about his life before salvation. This chapter might be titled, I Fought the Law and the Law Won. You remember Paul is talking about when the commandment came into his life. When the commandment came, well, he would have been very young, a young, devout Pharisee studying the law. He said, I I thought I was alive. I was once alive apart from the law, but then the commandment came and killed me. Well, who is it that would think they were alive? That would be a Jew, and yet they see the law and what it requires, 613 commands staring them in the face, and they realize their death. This is Romans 7. It's about Paul realizing his death. It's about Paul realizing his addiction to sin. He can't get away from it. He's miserable, and yet he's dedicated and committed, and he wants to do the right thing, but he can't do it. He's doing the very thing he doesn't want to do. And so what is the cause of that? Well, he's sold in bondage to sin, which takes us right to the beginning of where we're going to journey together today, and that is in verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh, sold into bondage to sin. So do you see what he's saying? The law is so spiritual. Look at the law. It's my focus. It's my specific purpose in life to be a law keeper. And it is so spiritual. And I know it's holy and good. And yet look again at me. I am sold in bondage to sin. Is that a Christian? Is that a believer? No way. That is not a believer. We've been bought with a price. Remember, we're a people of God's own possession. Paul said in the previous chapter, whoever has died has been freed from sin. And so as we look at this passage together, it's pretty important to understand where Paul is coming from. He's not presenting gloom and doom for the Christian. He's just recounting his resume as he tried to be a good law keeper with good intentions good motives. He wanted to do it, but he couldn't do it. Now, interview any devout Jewish person, any devout, dedicated, committed Jewish person today or back then and say, do you want to do good? What would they say? Yes, I want to do good. Do you want to keep the law? Yes, I want to keep the law. Can you do it? Well, not perfectly. Do you ever struggle? Yeah, sometimes I do the very thing I don't want to do. And then, if they really get insight, then they will even come to the point of saying, you know what, I think there's a power at work within me that is preventing me from doing what I want to do. Because I'm sold out to the law. I'm committed to it. I'm dedicated. There's nothing wrong with my eagerness. It's there. But the willingness, that willpower, is being overpowered by another power called sin. And so you could really come up with two great titles for this section of Scripture. I fought the law and the law won, or Saul of Tarsus, dedicated Pharisee, discovers the parasite called sin. I fought the law and the law won, But through that battle with the law, I discovered a parasite that was at work within me, holding me hostage. Who will deliver me? That's what this passage is about. It is not the normal Christian life. It is the normal law-based life. And the great news for us as believers is we're not under the law, and therefore we don't have to call this our new normal. This is not normal for the Christian. There is hope on this side of heaven. If we're not under the law, then we're not under the power of sin. 
But Paul has stated the opposite here. In verse 14, he has literally said, I am sold in bondage to sin. Come on. There's no way that we can believe our identity in Christ and then say five minutes later that we're sold in bondage to sin. Now, someone might be arguing, well, this is just the way Paul feels. That's a nice idea, but we're not seeing any evidence of that. This isn't Paul's feelings. He is talking about his status, his condition I am sold in bondage to the power called sin. I'm a slave of sin, would be another way to put it. And that clearly is someone who is still in Adam, not in Christ. Now, verse 15. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For I'm not practicing what I would like to do. But I'm doing the very thing that I hate. So, Great intentions, sounds like it. Good motives, absolutely. Dedication and commitment, he's got it in spades. But what happens? Poor results. The results come in and they don't look good. And so it's not about his desire to keep the law. That desire is there, but he's being thwarted. He's being prevented. He's being stifled. Something is taking over. And that's why he's going to even at one point say, it's no longer I who do it. It's not even me. It's something in me that's not me. I didn't know it was there, but now I realize. Is there a takeaway for you and me? I mean, is the point to just read through Romans 7 and say, see, it's Paul before salvation, therefore it's irrelevant, irrelevant to you and me. Of course, it's deep and meaningful and relevant. Here's the point. Whether you're lost or saved, you could choose to put yourself under the law and therefore experience failure. When you put yourself under the law, even as a saved person, God is not going to say, well, you know, they're saved, so I'm going to magically help them keep the law. No, the law was given knowing that nobody could keep it. Christians, unbelievers, nobody can keep the law. Only Jesus fulfilled it so that we wouldn't have to. So any Christian could still put themselves under the law and experience that same failure that Paul is talking about in Romans 7. But the point is, in context, the way he describes this human being, which is himself, he is not describing the nature of a believer. He is describing the nature and heart of an unbeliever who is devout and religious but can't seem to crank out righteousness under the law. Now, there's another takeaway. It's not just that, hey, Christian, you should stay away from the law. Apart from the law, sin is dead, so stay away from the law. That's implication number one. But implication number two is that there is a parasitic power. There is a parasite called sin that can operate through the members of our body. And even though this Pharisee is saying, look, I got taken over, I was dominated, I I was subject to this power called sin, and it, it had the best of me. I mean, it took advantage of me. Even though that's an unbelieving Pharisee, we as Christians can still say, huh, that's interesting. There's a parasitic power called sin. Sin is not just a verb, but it's also a noun. It's a tempter. It's something that wants to take advantage. But I'm dead to sin. I'm dead to the parasite. I'm dead to this power. Well, I I didn't even know it existed before. At least now, I have an awareness. And how does it get its power? From the law. They're in cahoots. We say that in Texas, cahoots. That means they're working together. Law and sin and sin and law, they're in cahoots. The law is not bad. The law is not sinful. But you put me under the law, and next thing you know, that power, that parasite called sin, is dominating and taking over. 
So there are implications for you and me as believers. Definitely stay away from Moses. Trust Jesus. At the same time, don't make Romans 7 your resume. Don't make Romans 7 your normal Christian life. It doesn't have to be. It was never meant to be. And so we see here in verse 16, But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. Now, here's our next evidence that he's an unbeliever. I agree with the law. So what's the focus? The law. I agree with the law. So what's the focus? It is law-keeping. That is the goal and the focus in this passage. Now, who would have keeping the law as their goal and focus? Clearly, a devout Jew. In fact, a Pharisee. A Pharisee of Pharisees. Not a Christian who's discovered the cross and the resurrection and received Christ and is now writing letters about righteousness by faith. No, this is a devout Pharisee who thinks You know, it's important for me to keep the law as my goal and keep the law as my focus, and I agree with the law. The only problem is I can't do it. That, my friend, is a failing Pharisee who's talking. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. Have you ever wondered why we call unbelievers slaves of sin? The Bible calls them that, slaves of sin. It's not that uh, unbelievers are just uh, bad all the time and ugly and awful and unlovable and detestable. It's that they're enslaved and they're addicted. They're joined, they're connected to the power called sin. And that's why our message is not you're ugly and you're awful and God detests you. No, the message is you're in prison, you're enslaved, and you don't even realize it. You're addicted to something, and you can't get free apart from Christ. It's a message of rescue, not a message of criticism. It's a message of hope, not a message of denigrating people. God so loved the world. He loves everybody, but the world is enslaved to sin. And so, what if you see people... Not just as uh, somebody who's in Adam. Not just somebody who, who needs heaven. Not just somebody who needs forgiveness. But someone who is actually addicted. They have a problem. They're enslaved. And they don't even realize how deep it goes. That's the purpose of Romans 7. Romans 7 is showing how deep the problem really goes. And it's because... They are being held captive by a power called sin. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of good is not. Now, I used to teach this was a Christian. I mean, years ago, I thought it was a believer. And so I would say, see, Paul is clarifying. Nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, as if he was pushing it off. But now I see, you know what? We can just read it as it is. Nothing good dwells in me. In fact, there's an evil power at work in my body, in my flesh, in this body. It's working in the members of my body, and there's nothing good about it. Let me tell you, it's enslaved me. I'm addicted to it. I can't say no to it. I've tried my best, and yet coveting, coveting, coveting is all that comes out because this power takes over. So again, the clearest reading of this passage is that this is a struggling man. He's a religious man. He's a devout man. But he is absolutely struggling and has no victory because something has overpowered him from within. Now, it's interesting because, again, once you look at this passage as Paul not yet saved, once you look at it as Saul of Tarsus, Pharisee of Pharisees, addicted religious zealot 
who's enslaved to sin, once you see it that way, then a very interesting question comes up. And here it is. Maybe it's one you've never thought about. It's kind of new for me. The power of sin is in an unbeliever and it operates through an unbeliever. But what about someone who is saved? Because without Romans 7, we don't see this power working from the inside out. If you delete Romans 7 from the New Testament, there is no fuel for the idea that this power is inside of the spiritual realm of the believer, only the unbeliever. What I'm saying is this. What if, watch this, an unbeliever is a slave of sin and sin dwells within them, but then they hear the gospel and they get saved and they break free from the power of sin, and it moves outside of them. It's not in them and of them, but it's outside of them, and is offering them thoughts and temptations from the outside in, not the inside out. So this is what it means to be dead to sin. Sin moves out. It can still bark at you, but it's all bark and no bite. And the flaming missiles of the enemy come from the outside at you, not from the inside out. That was before salvation, but now this gentleman, Jesus Christ, has moved in. And when he moves in, sin moves out. And yes, you are still tempted, and you can still be accused day and night. You can be afflicted, all of those things, by the enemy. But the evil one cannot touch you, and he certainly does not reside within you. So, interpreting Romans 7 this way really matters, and it opens up all kinds of new doors to a better understanding of your identity in Christ. That you don't have two natures, you don't have two selves, and you certainly don't have this parasite inside of your spiritual being or inside of your soul or anything like that. You're being tempted from without. Sin is in the world, but sin is not part of you or part of who you are. For the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. Again, you have to ask yourself, what's the focus? In context, it's law-keeping the Jewish law, Moses, and he can't do it. That's all he's saying. But if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. He's already said it once, folks. He said it in verse 17. And now he's saying it in verse 20. The same thing he has said twice. It is no longer I who am doing it, but sin which dwells where? In me. Not just in my members, but in me. Does sin dwell in a Christian? You're not going to find that. You're not going to find it. Oh, sure, you'll find don't offer your members to sin, but that doesn't mean sin is inside of you. I would say don't offer your body to the world. Don't offer your body to a prostitute. Don't offer your body to the, to the devil. Don't offer your body to whatever, including the power of sin. But sin is not in a believer. It's not part of who you are. And yet here in Romans 7, we're seeing the description as, it's no longer I who do it, but sin in me. This is that devout Pharisee saying, you know what, this problem goes deeper than I thought. I thought my bloodline would take care of me. I thought this Jewish blood of of Israel, Pharisee of Pharisees, born of the right tribe, born on the right day, as to righteousness, my buddies found me blameless. I thought that my lineage and my heritage would take care of me, but then I realized 
there's a deeper problem within me, within who I am. I'm addicted and enslaved, and I can't get away from it. I should be in Sinners Anonymous asking for help. And yet I thought I was doing great until the law came in and I saw the true standard. And it was like looking in that magnified mirror and it showed me how deep this problem goes. It is deeply seated and deeply rooted within me. That's an unbeliever talking, not a Christian. You don't have sin in you. You've got Christ in you. I find then, he says, that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. Now again, teaching it the other way, you could say, well, look, this is somebody who wants to do good, so it's got to be a Christian. Look, they want to do good. But remember how we're defining good. How is good defined here? Is it bearing the fruit of the Spirit? Is that what good means in this passage? Nope, you won't find the fruit of the Spirit anywhere. What does doing good mean in this passage? In context, what he is saying is, I find this principle, this power of sin is at work in me, the one who wants to keep the law but can't. That's how you define good here. Good, or so-called good, is law-keeping. And that's his goal, and that's his focus, and yet he can't do it. For I joyfully concur, here's the evidence, look, verse 22. I joyfully concur with what? With the law of God in the inner man. Somebody says, oh, look, he used the word inner man. That's got to be a Christian, they say. Well, guess what? I mean, every human has an inner man and an outer man. Unbelievers have an inner man. They're dead to God, alive to sin. They have an inner man that's in Adam. And they have an outer man, which is their body. You have an inner man and an outer man, an inner self and an outer self. So the presence of this expression for Paul doesn't mean a Christian. It just means you got your inside part. And then you got your outside part, your earth suit, your body. And so, let's read it again carefully. Look at what he's saying. Verse 22. I joyfully concur with the law of God on the inside. That's what he means. Why? Because he's not a, a Gentile, a dirty, rotten Gentile. He's not a pagan. He's an Israelite. He's a Jew. Inside his inner self, on the inside, what is every Jew taught to want and to desire? Every Jewish person in their right mind would say to you, even if you interviewed them, yes, yes, I concur. I joyfully concur with the law of God. It's good stuff. I'm supposed to do it. Whoa, do you see how this thing blows wide open? when you interpret Romans 7 the way Paul intended. Let's continue. But, the young Pharisee says, I see a different law in the members of my body waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin which is in my members. Now, who's a prisoner? Who's a prisoner of sin, a Christian or a non-Christian? Obviously, it's the unbeliever. Somebody says, well, you know, Christians can act as if. Christians can act like they're prisoners of sin. Yeah, and in those moments, they're being deceived. But this isn't about somebody acting like. This is just a straight-up statement that this person is made into a prisoner of sin. Now, the second thing I want you to notice is there's, the word law appears a lot here. It doesn't always mean Moses. Sometimes it can mean the principle or the power. So in this verse, we've actually got a little window into what's happening inside of this Jewish man. He's got a powerful mind. 
I mean, he knows what to do. He's got a lot of willpower. He's got a lot of smarts. He's got a lot of mind. And yet, there's something at work in his body that is fighting his mind. That's what he's saying. I'm torn. It's my body versus my mind, and my mind versus my body. And what is so frustrating is my body wins. Because there's a power at work in my body that overpowers my mind. And I don't have enough willpower. I don't have enough gumption. I can't get it done. That's what he's saying. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Now, does that make better sense to you than ever? The body of this death? He doesn't hate his body. But there is death occurring in his body because this power called sin is fighting his mind. It's the mind versus the body and the body versus the mind. And all the good intentions up here as a devout Jew are being thwarted and prevented by this parasite that is bringing nothing but death through his body. And so he's torn It's like he's been sawn in two and half of him over here is all those good intentions. And then the other half is the reality of how stuck he is. Miserable, wretched man that I am, who will set me free? Folks, that right there should be enough. Have you been set free from sin and death? Yes. Romans 8 is going to tell us that. You've been set free from sin and death, but not this guy. He hasn't been set free yet. That's why it says, look at it again, verse 24, who will, future tense, who will set me free? And of course, the answer is Jesus. He's the one who will do it. So he sums up, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God. But on the other, with my flesh or my body, the law of sin. He's summing up the struggle. Everything he's been saying for a dozen verses is encapsulated right here in this final verse. And what he's saying is, It's my mind versus my body and my body versus my mind and I need rescue and thanks be to God that there will be rescue. There is rescue coming. I know because I know the end of the story. But let me sum up the problem. All good intentions up here. But there's something operating through my body and I cannot stop it. And it's because I'm part of a fallen world and I'm a fallen being And this power is at work. Who's going to rescue me? And you know what's coming. I'll give you a preview of coming attractions and then we'll leave it there for this week. But look at this. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has, past tense, has set you free from the law of sin and death. What is the law of sin and death? It's just like the law of gravity. What goes up has to come down. Every time there's sin, you experience death. Unless you're a Christian. If you're a Christian, then a greater law has taken over. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death and sin, and death. You don't experience death when you sin. You experience grace and forgiveness and life eternal. Can you see it? We got to show the futility of law keeping. We got to describe that old way of living in order to highlight what a big deal it is that we've been rescued. And you, my friend, if you're in Christ, you have been rescued. You have been set free. You have been given a new life and a new way forward. And it's not about Moses. And it's not about trying your hardest. It's about Jesus. 
and trusting that he's done it all and that he really has set you free. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this victory. We thank you for this joy, the real thing of just knowing that you moved in and sin moved out. That we can be tempted, but it's not our heart. We can be tempted, but it's not our nature. We're tempted from a power on the outside, flaming arrows coming at us. But you live in us, and we live in you. And we're sealed with your Spirit. And we're okay. You've made us off the charts great with you. You've given us peace. You've given us life. You've given us righteousness. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.